Are you looking for a unique and interesting species of sundew? One that's easy to care for and doesn't require dormancy as part of its normal growing cycle? Well, it's hard to go past Drosera capensis, otherwise known as the Cape sundew, because it comes from the Cape in South Africa. Here it experiences tropical conditions where temperatures rarely, if ever, dip below freezing. That's why it's classified as a tropical sundew. The fact that it doesn't dip below freezing often where it comes from means that this species of sundew doesn't have to shut down. It just keeps growing and growing throughout the year. So from that point of view, it's a species of sundew which you can enjoy year round as well. Now let's have a closer look at this unique species of sundew. So straight away when you look at this species of sundew are these long lateral leaves. Like all sundews, they're characterized by dew covering those leaves. The dew is actually a mucilage, which is a type of glue. And it's that glue which attracts, captures, and eventually digests insects which happen to land on these leaves. Now these leaves from the base here to the tips of the leaves they get to around about say 15 to 20 centimeters long so this plant here is not quite mature it's a juvenile plant what's interesting is that the dew doesn't start until a little bit up the leaf all this here is just bare and then that's when the dew starts all the way to the tips of the of the leaf. Now what I really love about this species of sundew is the colour contrast between those red covered stalks that's got the glue on them and the green leaf base. It really does add a nice colour effect to the plant. And it also adds a nice colour effect to any carnivorous plant's garden that you add this plant to. This is a rosette forming species of sundew, meaning that the leaves are produced from the centre of the plant and then they just develop outwards from there in all directions. All these old leaves here just the old leaves and they just fall by the wayside what you can do you can actually prune those old leaves off to make it look more presentable but I just tend to leave them on there now what's interesting is that every now and again you'll see a leaf which has a distinct bend in it and what what that indicates is that it's caught a larger insect or quite a few insects and to help digest and capture those insects it just the whole leaf just tends to bend over and it slowly envelops whatever it's caught so just have a look at this video here that I shot earlier at my nursery you can see this house fly is really having a hard time getting away from those stalks which are just bending towards it and then that whole leaf is slowly enveloping that housefly. That just shows you just how these, how sensitive these leaves are on this species of sundew. Now I'm just going to zoom in on this leaf over here. See all these black spots? They're all tiny flies which have been caught. There's another one over here as well, all these little black spots on there. So it's very effective at catching various sizes of insects from little tiny gnats to house flies and even damselflies. Here's a picture here of a damselfly which managed to get itself caught. But all in all, it's a very unique and showy species of sundew.
So what about care requirements for drostrate capensis? So as I said in my intro, they're very easy to look after. They're quite forgiving in their care uh, conditions. And as a result, they're ideal for beginners. What's most important is that you never allow the peat moss, which is the potting medium that they're growing in, to have it dry out. And the easiest way to do that is to use the tray method. Just ensure that there's water in that tray. That water will be absorbed into that peat moss and that will keep your plant hydrated and happy. Now, it's best to use soft water when watering your plant. Soft water is basically either rainwater, distilled water, or reverse osmosis filtered water. That's water that has a minimal or low dissolved salts in it. If you do use tap water, try to use it on a short-term basis only. Over time, tap water will burn the roots of your plant because there's too many dissolved salts in it, like chlorides and fluorides and phosphates, whatever. And in time, it can even produce deformed leaves on your plant. So just a few things there to consider. So what about light requirements? Well, this species can tolerate direct or indirect sunlight or filtered light. So this, uh, these plants get around about eight to nine hours of direct sunlight every day here at my backyard nursery. It seems like a lot, but there's no evidence of leaf burn. So that's a sign that this species can tolerate large amounts of direct sunlight. Now, in terms of filtered light, if you've got a tree in your backyard that is blocking a lot of the direct sunlight, you can still grow these plants. How do I know this? Well, every now and again, I'll see a little seedling starting to emerge around the base of my North American pitcher plants. Of course, they're a lot taller and they provide a lot of filtered light on top. But despite that, these plants seem to grow uh, quite nicely. You can, of course, grow them indoors on a sunny windowsill. I recommend providing at least five hours of direct sunlight and at least seven to eight hours of filtered light. And of course, you can grow them under LED lights as well. So for pot sizes, I use 140 millimeter high pots, plastic pots. I have noticed when I unpot these plants that the roots are quite long in comparison to the plant. So I try to give them a little bit of depth by using larger pots like this one over here. Now you can of course use shallower pots, but what I have noticed is that the growth isn't as vigorous, it's not as quick as if plants growing in deeper pots like this one over here. So when it comes to potting medium, I have found out online that they're not very picky. In my case, I use three parts peat moss to one part perlite. The perlite nicely aerates that peat moss and the plants seem to grow very nicely in there. Um, but of course, you can of course experiment which, to whichever one you like, whichever materials you have, but I have found out online that they're not very picky when it comes to the potting medium. Drosera capensis are well known for producing masses of seeds. They produce self-pollinating flowers. They don't rely on insects to pollinate. The fact that they produce a lot of seeds means you have to be careful that they don't spread too much to other plants. If you allow the plants to flower, then multiple seedlings can grow in the same pot, overcrowding each other, just like here. What can also happen is that sometimes seedlings can overshadow other plants in other pots. So to control this, simply cut off the flowers whenever you see them. Not only will this help control the spread of seedlings, but it will also promote more vigorous growth in the leaves of the Drosera capensis. So as I said in my intro, Drosera capensis comes from tropical areas. So that means that the temperatures rarely, if ever, drop below freezing. So what if you live in an area where temperatures do go below zero occasionally? Can you still grow this plant? Well, after doing a little bit of research online, I have discovered that these plants may die back down to the roots due to the cold conditions. As soon as the warmer temperatures come along, they will come up with their uh, new leaves. So 
something to be aware of if you do experience those freezing conditions every now and again you may want to give this plant a go and it'll still grow for you it's just that it will slow its growth and, and may even uh, die back down to its roots as a, a um, reaction to those freezing conditions okay so here's just a quick look at my cape sundews here at my nursery my open nursery as I said earlier they're getting around about eight to nine hours of direct sunlight a day these have been individually potted you can see the nice effect they have when they're all together like this more so in the sun when that dew starts to glisten and over here that's an example of a plant which I've just allowed to flower and produce seeds and as you can see that's quite cramped and by putting them in individual pots like this they look a lot more presentable because they have that space for those leaves to go outwards rather than growing just upwards when they're crowded like down here here's another form of Cape Sunyu, this is a reddish form, it's a dwarf form it's a bit hard to see because again I've just allowed that to seed and it's getting very crowded in there that's what the flowers look like um, you can see all those seeds so many seeds coming up that's why they're so prolific at spreading so quickly and just to show you briefly another form of Cape Sunju, this is Drosera capensis, the alba form. I think it's referring to the albino form, but look how different that looks. It has leaves, the lack of that red pigmentation in there. So, yeah, just shows you how the forms vary depending on where they come from and the cultivars. And down the back there, you can see Drosera capensis growing around the base of those North American pitcher plants. I don't mind that because they themselves control aphids by capturing them. Those aphids can affect those young shoots of the North American pitcher plant. And funny enough, Drosera capensis themselves can affect, get affected by aphids. So every now and again it's worthwhile having a look inside the center of the rhizome there of the plant and look out for any deformed shoots coming up as soon as you see any aphids in there don't forget to use the dew on the leaves to pick them up with a toothpick or something similar so why not give Drosera capensis a go. It really is the ideal beginner's carnivorous plant. With its long linear leaves and those red stalks covered in mucilage, contrasting with that green leaf base, it really is a showy sundew. And whether it's just by itself or whether you add it to another carnivorous plant's garden, it really does add an interesting contrasting effect. Now, it's very forgiving, as I said before, in the care that you give it, whether it be the amounts of light that you give it or the temperatures that it um, grows in. And as I said before, even if it does go below zero degrees Celsius, there's a good chance that your plant will bounce back. Now, if you're going to be bringing your plant indoors, you're going to have to think about feeding it if you really want to bring out the best in your plant. This is especially uh, over the winter period where there's no insects around so um, unlike venus flytraps the prey item that you place on the leaf doesn't have to be alive for digestion to occur 
doesn't matter whether it's alive or dead all you've got to do is just place your uh, place the food on the leaf here I've placed a blood worm that's been thawed out and the amazing thing is is that after a couple of hours you can actually see that leaf starting to bend over what you've placed on it indicating that your plant is happily feeding I have heard that you can also use fish flakes and of course you can always use natural prey items again it doesn't matter whether it's alive or dead your plant should accept it so until next time everyone happy growing I've just placed this species on my website on my online shop so get on there have a look at the information the care guidelines and as I said before why not give it a go